Hello everyone, Chris Potts here. This is part two in our series of screencasts on presuppositions. Part one provided definitions and examples, and it discussed the important concept of presupposition accommodation. Our focus in this screencast will be on identifying presuppositions in the wild using some simple tests. To start building up these tests, it's useful to consider in a more focused way how presuppositions behave in discourse. My first theme here is backgrounding. In the prototypical case, presuppositions are agreed upon as true before they're invoked. Now I stress that this is prototypical in some sense. It may not be the most frequent case, but it's in some sense the norm. And of course, accommodation creates many exceptions to this, but it's important that presuppositions always can be backgrounded without too much sense of redundancy. For example, even for mundane things like owning a dog, it's okay to be explicit about what the presuppositions are, as in, I have a dog and my dog has brown hair. Or one could say, it's Wednesday and Ed realizes that, or Ed used to smoke but he stopped. In all three cases, the presupposition triggered in the second clause is just spelled out in the first, and these things don't seem redundant to me. For a comparison, consider the non-presupposed but still peripheral content expressed by the italicized material in the following example. Otto Jesperson likes burgers and Noam Chomsky likes cheese sandwiches. Otto, who likes burgers, usually slathers them in ketchup. Here it seems really repetitive to say who likes burgers, right? This content isn't presupposed, but rather conveyed indirectly, and so it's redundant given the first sentence. For presuppositions, though, there's generally no sense of redundancy because, after all, presuppositions are supposed to be backgrounded. Let's move now to the second set of discourse observations that I want to make, which relate to hearer objections to presupposed content. Now, presuppositions are meanings that the speaker takes for granted and thus assumes to be uncontroversial, or at least they're acting as if they assume that. As a result, speakers might even go so far as to express certain pieces of information via presupposition triggers in order to signal what is and isn't up for debate. And as a result of all this, objecting to presuppositions can be difficult. And the crux of this is that standard denials are generally taken to just accept the presuppositions and target only the sort of core semantic content. For example, if I say, Sam quit smoking and you want to object that Sam never smoked in the past, you're in for some work, right? You can't just say no or wrong or impossible or no, he didn't or even I doubt it. All these utterances will be construed as accepting that he smoked in the past and denying that he isn't smoking now. So this doesn't challenge the presupposition at all. When speakers do want to object to presupposed content, they typically have to resort to more specialized forms that kind of disrupt the flow of conversation in order to re-invoke the presupposed content as an item for discussion. For example, you could use an idiom like, wait a minute, or hold on just a sec, and then you have to state the presupposition explicitly. This sort of unearths the presupposition from the discourse common ground so that it can be in focus and discussed and debated. And that actually provides a nice transition into our core tests for presuppositions. And I've placed these under the heading of presupposition projection. And that's how these tests are often described in the literature. The guiding metaphor, as you'll see, is that presuppositions expressed syntactically in embedded positions tend to project up through the entire sentence to become presuppositions of the entire sentence, even where we might expect semantic operators to target them and change them. The negation test is perhaps the clearest instance of this surprising behavior. Our core hypothesis is hypothesis N. If proposition P is a presupposition of sentence S, then P is a presupposition of the negated version of S as well. So here, clearly, the presupposition will project through the negation untouched by it. Let's consider a simple example. We start with sentence S as Sam stopped smoking, and our target meaning is the proposition that Sam smoked in the past. Now, if this target meaning is a presupposition, then it will project through the negation in the negated version of S, which is Sam didn't stop smoking. And indeed it does. Our target meaning survived the negation untouched. The proposition that Sam smoked in the past remains a commitment of the negated version of S as well. The pattern will be the same for these others. For example, if we begin with Ed realizes that it's Wednesday and we're targeting the meaning that it's Wednesday, that is the meaning of the embedded clause, 
Then we create the negated version of the sentence. Here, Ed doesn't realize that it's Wednesday. And we find that that sentence continues to commit the speaker to our target meaning. So we have more evidence for our presuppositional analysis. I've also tested the presuppositions of the possessive my in 24, starting with my dog is outside. I feel it's fine to test this with my dog isn't outside, but sometimes people like to see the negation literally scoping syntactically over the trigger. And so I've been a bit heavy handed here with it is not the case that my dog is outside. Of course, this continues to commit the speaker to owning a dog, and indeed, pretty much any way that you negate the full sentence will do this. At this point, we can make sense of our observations before concerning how hard it is to directly object to presuppositions in discourse. Hypothesis N explains why this is so, right? If someone says, Sam quit smoking, and you reply with no or no, he didn't, your utterance is just elliptical for no, Sam didn't quit smoking. And by hypothesis N, that utterance will carry the same presuppositions as the utterance you're trying to object to. All right, let's move to our second test. This one focused on interrogatives. Our core hypothesis is hypothesis Q, and it has the same structure as hypothesis N. If proposition P is a presupposition of sentence S, then P is a presupposition of the interrogative version of S as well. Let's start again with our core sentence, Sam stopped smoking, and again target the meaning that Sam smoked in the past. Our interrogative version is, did Sam stop smoking? Asking this question commits the speaker to our target meaning, and so we have some additional evidence that stop is triggering this presupposition. In the same way, we can test realize. Our sentence S is, Ed realizes that it's Wednesday, and the interrogative version is, does Ed realize it's Wednesday? If you ask this, you're committing yourself to it being Wednesday, and so a presuppositional analysis of realize seems increasingly well supported. And finally, my dog is outside. There's no construal of the question, is my dog outside, where it's querying whether the speaker has a dog. In other words, P comes through untouched, supporting our presupposition analysis of the possessive. Our third test follows the same pattern, but it's a tiny bit more involved. So this one focuses on conditional antecedents. These are the if clauses in if-then statements. And the hypothesis says, if proposition P is a presupposition of sentence S, then P is a presupposition of any sentence of the form if S, then S prime. Perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind here is that you have to focus on the if clause, the antecedent. If you target the then clause, then you'll be doing something very different and definitely not running our test. So here's an illustration. Again, start with Sam stopped smoking and our usual target meaning that Sam smoked in the past. To run this test, we create a conditional like, if Sam stopped smoking, then his marathon time should improve. This commits the speaker to our target meaning, and so we have more evidence for our presuppositional analysis of stop. The realize example continues to support our analysis of that trigger as well, and running the test on my dog would, I think, yield the expected picture there as well. So those are the core tests. It's useful now to step back and ask, why do they hold? Are they just random constellations of observations or are there some principles at work here? And I think the answer is clear. The reason the tests are useful is that they all involve devices that let us back away from the core semantic content of the sentence involved. Conditional antecedents do this by creating a hypothetical around the content in the if clause. Interrogatives do this by querying the content, certainly not committing to it. And negation goes all the way to the extreme of committing to the negation of the core content. So in all these cases, we have a clear modulation of the core semantic content by these operators. And then the striking thing is that presuppositional content is different. It projects through, right? It's untouched by all this. Why? Well, because it's already supposed to be embedded in the common ground, right? Stereotypically, the trigger is not creating this content, but rather just evoking it or drawing on it. Of course, accommodation makes that a bit more complex than this simple story, but I think the intuition carries through. One final topic for the screencast under the heading of why not turn them around? What I mean by this is that all our tests have the conditional format that begins if P is a presupposition. And if you reflect on that, you find that it's pretty limiting. We need to assume presupposition status and see what follows. So if we're very strict about this, this means that the tests are useful only for disconfirming that P is a presupposition. Because we could reason, for example, that if P isn't a presupposition of the negated version of the sentence, then P isn't a presupposition. 
but we want to use our test to make positive diagnoses of content as presupposed. So what should we do? Well, one tempting thing would be to strengthen the test by adopting the other direction. In this mode, hypothesis n would be augmented with hypothesis n prime. If proposition p is expressed in the scope of negation in sentence s, but p remains a commitment of s, then p is a presupposition of s. Hypotheses like these would allow us to make instant diagnoses of presuppositions. However, unfortunately, I think we can't adopt such tests. Consider a sentence like, Sam didn't see Joan, who works in accounting, when he came in today. The proposition that Joan works in accounting projects through the negation here clearly. And if we adopted hypothesis n prime, we'd have to say that this content was presupposed. But it won't behave like a presupposition in really any other way. For instance, you can't background it, and it's not something you're being asked to accommodate. It seems like a different kind of content, frankly. And the same goes for the expressive content of a word like friggin' in I don't want any friggin' broccoli in my dinner. It's very hard to say what friggin' contributes here, maybe something like heightened negative emotion. But whatever it contributes, it's not a presupposition. I might, in fact, be using this little outburst to announce my frustration at the broccoli idea. But this content is projecting up through the negation here, and so hypothesis n prime would compel us to say that it was presupposed. And that, again, just seems like a mistake. So what should we do? Well, I'm inclined to be pragmatic. It's okay to informally turn the tests around, as long as that's part of a larger argument in, one, in which one looks at a wide spectrum of data. So gather lots of data and consider the discourse behavior of the item as well. And then I think the picture will become reasonably clear, even sticking with just the weaker versions of our hypotheses.